Hey everybody, Newland here. So let's continue discussing the Milky Way galaxy. We're going to start by thinking about how the spiral arms are the way they are and how they make stars. They are these areas in a spiral galaxy where the gas and dust and many, many stars are all kind of smushed together. And I know I've said before that it's kind of like when you're uh, there's a, a traffic accident up ahead and everybody kind of has to slow down until you can all sort of crawl past it. It's called a density wave. These density waves, as they uh, not only is the gas and dust clumping together, making it more likely for star formation to happen, but the young stars that are in there, some of them are going to explode and send shock waves through the gas, causing these you know, generation after generation, almost like a domino effect of using the gas and dust in the Milky Way arms and any spiral galaxy really to form stars. So it's, you know, a kind of repetitive cycle. And stars can move through these density waves. They'll go back to their normal Keplerian orbital speeds once they make their way through them. But in the process of being there, they're going to interact with one another and push and pull and tug and lots of stuff like that. Uh, so they're exact sort of evolution, how they formed and where they eventually sort of end up is really very poorly understood. We know it's kinematic in nature, meaning it's definitely about gravity and spinning, but dark matter and its presence on the outer part of a galaxy plays a role as well. Um, so let's talk about the kind of stars that are in galaxies like the Milky Way. So specifically, the Milky Way has three kind of um, population of stars. Population one would be stars like the sun. They're quote unquote metal rich. So they've gone through generations of this process of making the stuff heavier than hydrogen and helium. And they end up in the, the next generation of stars. So they're metal rich, they're younger, they're often hotter, brighter. They're found mainly in the thick disk of the galaxy. So the sun is one of these. Uh, it's about 2% of the stars in the Milky Way. And uh, population two stars would be metal poor, which means that uh, if, you were to consider the amount of, um, say, iron divided by the amount of helium or hydrogen. Well, hydrogen's the the, the uh, equation I have at the top there. Uh, so often we'll take the proportion of iron atoms and divide by the proportion of hydrogen atoms. And uh, there's more; it's more to it than that. But metallicity is a way of um, numerically describing the amount of stuff that's not hydrogen and helium in a star. So population two stars are metal poor, they're older, they're cooler, they're dimmer. They're found mainly in the central region of the galaxy. They're very, very, very packed in and uh, very chaotic. Their motions are very chaotic, uh, even though orbits may be, you know, um, elliptical, predicting which ones are going to do what and how uh, their eccentricity might fall. That's all kind of difficult to predict. Then there is a population three set of stars, which are, although they almost certainly had to have existed, their nature's not well understood, and uh, we've never actually found them. They should be the very oldest. They should be just hydrogen and helium. And if there are any small red ones of these around, they've we've not been able to demonstrate that stars with absolutely no metals are indeed from this population. They are almost certainly going to be very small, very dim, and they could be mixed in with the population two stars or one star. So it's likely or at least possible that they're not around anymore. So just before I go off the slide, there is a numerical way to denote metallicity. It's so you can see that metallicity is denoted with Z often. And then there's uh, Z X plus Y plus Z equals a one. So <clears throat> their percentage, their percentages of hydrogen and helium. So uh, Z sun is 0 0.02 or 2% not hydrogen and helium, which means 98% of it is. And uh, the metals come from fusion, including um, doubling of atoms and high, the triple alpha process and uh, neutron capture, both rapid and slow. Okay, so that's those are the three populations of stars. Most stars that we kind of think of near the near us are population one, but the truth is that the Milky Way has many, many, many stars in the population two category. They're just already done doing their thing. New stars, of course, are going to be population one. So galaxies collide. You can see here a little computer model showing the the Milky Way uh, sort of uh, settling over time uh, into uh, this 
sort of spiralish pattern. And then, you know, here we are. Andromeda is coming our way. There's another galaxy called M33 as well. And the thing is that even though galaxies may settle down, they are going to merge with one another. So there's never a period where they're just going to be that way forever. So here's a future view, 3 point what, 4 billion, 3.5 billion years in the future. The two kind of calm and settled Andromeda and Milky Way spiral galaxies will mess each other up and merge into something new. Triangulum will eventually be along for the ride as well, by the way. Um, astronomers sometimes use the term Milkomeda, which I think is super weird. And uh, we will form Andromeda... Milky Way and Triangulum will form into a different type of galaxy altogether called the, um, well, the type is called elliptical. We'll save that chapter, we'll save that for the chapter on, on galactic evolution. But on the left hand side, as this thing still plays, and you can see that we'll end up with this red and dead, meaning no new stars are forming in that new Milkometa galaxy. Uh, uh, you can see what happens when we've got smaller neighbors that we eat. Uh, on the left-hand side is this image of what's probably going to happen to the large and small Magellanic clouds. It's already happening to some dwarf galaxies that we've already ripped apart into these, these streamers of stars. Um, if it's just a small galaxy, then the all that's really going to happen is we'll end up with mo more stars in the Milky Way. But if it's a big galaxy, like on the right, we'll end up becoming a, a completely different type of galaxy altogether. So how the the um, you know future will will unfold for the Milky Way is really um, dependent on how big the thing we run into is. Now Andromeda and Milky Way are heading towards each other, even though it will take billions of years for this process to happen. It's already happening. So it's a very slow motion collision, but it is a collision. So we're not there yet, but it is coming. And uh, so be ready. Prepare yourself now. Um, it should be fun. It'll be a really cool thing to view. So the story about how galaxies merge and how they collide, including us ripping apart the little dwarf galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds, really is where we should introduce the idea of dark matter. So if you think about it, the disk of the galaxy, including where the sun is located, it should act like a Keplerian orbit. P squared equals A cubed. The farther away you are, the longer it takes. And for the most part, that is indeed what we see. Uh, measuring even near the galactic center, uh, orbits of stars are, are Keplerian in nature. But there are two people we need to bring into the story. One of them is the strange fellow... Fritz Zwicky, seen here doing the I'm a little teapot dance, which um, he's kind of famous for being eccentric, and he would often do this on my request. And uh, at the bottom is Vera Rubin, who really sort of uh, took the Fritz Zwicky idea of what dark matter might be to new levels. You can see here a map of the Milky Way on the bottom axis is how far away in thousands of parsecs uh, a star might be. And on the Y axis is how fast it goes around the center. So you can see that there's this rapid increase towards the origin, which doesn't even matter too much. And then we've got these you know, little bobbles in here that are the result of uh, where you are in the disk. But you know, it seems to sort of follow this Keplerian pattern. And you can see the dashed line here. This is what we would expect for stars that are in the outer part of the galaxy, even the, the, the globular clusters in the halo. You know, we would expect them to follow Keplerian orbits. They don't. The speed is kind of like all of the things out there are embedded in some solid, you know, invisible structure, making them rotate. And there's a lot more mass in the outer, outer part of the galaxy than in the inner part of the galaxy. And that includes in the supermassive black hole, there's way more matter in the outer part of our Milky Way than there is in the central region. And um, the, the term that we came up with, dark matter, is really the result of us not knowing what in the heck this stuff could be. And uh, it's pretty common to hear about Fritz Zwicky when you hear about this, but it's only kind of recently that Vera Rubin has kind of gotten her due. Um, so much so that we're naming an observatory after her, and, you know, she's... Uh, well-respected uh, in really trying to figure out what dark matter could be. Fritz Wicke was like, it's there. Uh, it must be stuff that we don't know yet. And Rubin is famous for doing this for a bunch of different kinds of galaxies. So what in the heck is it? 
Well, it could be, you can see a bulleted list here. It could be something called machos. It could be something called wimps, or it could be just stars. So here's the thing. Whatever dark matter is, it doesn't appear to give off wavelengths of light that we can see, and it doesn't appear to absorb wavelength of light that we can see. And I don't just mean in the visible, I mean the entire EM spectrum. The problem then is if it doesn't seem to absorb or emit any wavelength of photon, how in the heck are we going to study it? So for a long time, the first two bullet points were the leading contenders. It's got to be something massive out there, like maybe some black holes. Maybe it's just that we can't see all of the brown dwarf stars and, and red dwarf stars and and white dwarfs. Maybe they're just out there, but they're faint. And decades were spent trying to, after Vera Rubin looked at lots of galaxies and saw that all of them appear to have dark matter, if they're, especially all the spiral galaxies, if they all have it, then we should be able to survey them and find some of these massive uh, compact halo objects or machos and find some brown dwarf, white dwarf, and red dwarfs. Well, here's the thing. We were able to find some black holes, some brown dwarfs, some white dwarfs, some red dwarfs. But those first two bullet points, even adding in as much as we could possibly find, there was still an unbelievable amount of material out there. And so the kind of leading contender for what dark matter must mainly be made up of. Uh, now think about it this way. The first two bullet points, once we found the black holes and found the brown dwarfs, they're not dark matter at all. They were just mass that we had not counted. So then it's not weird. Then it's not, you don't need any new physics. You just hadn't found them yet. But we're really left with the third category having to be explained. Weakly interacting massive particles, WIMPs. If machos are massive, compact halo objects, which would be like black holes out in the outer part of the galaxy, wimps, where would they be? Weakly interacting massive particles. And uh, before I talk any more about that, there at the bottom there is a pie chart. You can see that dark matter, the purple sort of color, is about 23% of the energy mass sort of ratio. That non-luminous matter, it's out there but it's not glowing, is about 36 so gas and dust, and then there's luminous matter, and black holes too would be non-luminous. Then in the luminous matter category, there's only 0 0.4. So that also leaves 73% of the energy mass ratio in a completely new thing that we have not even addressed yet called dark energy. But dark energy doesn't impact the behavior of galaxies. It's really only the dark matter, the non-luminous matter, and the luminous matter, because dark energy doesn't have any gravity, but all the other ones do. So the trick is, if, if Zwicky and Rubin are right, that these something, some sort of material in the outer part of spiral galaxies and elliptical galaxies, if it's out there giving them their mass, what must it be? And we still don't know. There has been some recent work with LIGO, where they found the uh, merging black holes, to... Uh, bring in a new category. Like maybe with these gravitational wave events, we might be able to find many more black holes than we thought. Now it's, that's not, the last year has not been, has not added a lot of data to that. So we're still kind of left with the wimps versus machos argument, but wimps still seems to be the sort of leading contender, meaning that these weird subatomic particles might be in the room with us. They might exist only in the outer part of the galaxy. Uh, there might be more than you know one type of them, uh, like cold dark matter versus hot dark matter. And uh, we really don't know. And kind of every available avenue is being explored for what subatomic particles these might be because they wouldn't interact with each other they wouldn't uh, meaning they could literally pass through each other however in the world that works so they seem to have mass but no other properties so they're very very mysterious if this is really true and then there's a weird little graph there of all the different models that we're trying to use to explain um dark matter and the all the different colors you can see where macho is and uh, you can see um, femto lensing and uh, imaging of the background radiation. There's all these attempts to try and narrow it down. And the only one of them that we can't sort of mark off the list right now would be WIMPs, uh, even though LIGO is hoping to maybe find some more, you know, merging um, black holes like you see in the top right. We haven't found any yet. So uh, exactly what this could be, giant mystery. So we're not done talking about it, but um, that's as much as we got right now. Okay, so 
how could we possibly try to account for the dark matter by finding more stars? LIGO, of course, could help us find merging black holes, but there is a technique here. And actually, we've done a pretty good job with this. Uh, this is how we found uh, white dwarf and red dwarf and brown dwarf stars in our galaxy and the nearby galaxies. Something that seems completely impossible. It's l gravitational lensing, meaning that the space around a, a star literally warps the space around it so that, I'm sorry, the star itself warps the space around it. So it kind of makes it like a lens. And the uh, picture on the bottom right is showing a white dwarf star in the Milky Way that we happen to know of already. And it passed in front of a background star. And when it did, the background star was suddenly very, very bright. Completely insane technique. So we've been able to employ this uh, through through globular clusters and in the Milky Way to find many brown dwarf, white dwarf, and red dwarf stars. And it did indeed knock the number down. So it turns out that we didn't need as much dark matter as we thought. Here's some of the stuff that's actually there, but we just didn't see it. So this, you can tell how hard we're trying to make dark matter not something magical, but something that we already know about. Uh, but even with that, uh, observation of these events suggested that low mass white dwarfs could account for 20% of the mass, but quite frankly, all the rest of the mass that seems to exist in the outer part of the galaxy is still missing. So I just thought this was a really cool technique, so I wanted to talk about it. The fact that we could use the gravity of a white dwarf as a lens around itself for background objects and wait for them to flare up, that's super cool. So let's talk about the center of the galaxy and the supermassive black hole, which is known as Sagittarius A star. So here is a, a, a map of all of the crazy motion going on in the center of our galaxy. You can see that Sagittarius A star is, is labeled right there. Um, and there's all these bubbles and all these weird shapes of gas that's doing all kinds of stuff. This would be the area just outside what we would think of as the accretion disk. I told you it's very chaotic. And you can see that there is a lot going on. Now, this is all gas and dust, but we, we're going to look at stars here in a minute. So the stellar density is a million times that of what we see in our part of the Milky Way. There is a ring of gas about 400 parsecs across, which looks like the sort of um, you know outer edge of what would we would think of as the start of the accretion disk. We can tell that there are very strong magnetic fields, which isn't surprising because this gas is really hot. And when hot gas moves, you get magnetic fields because it's electrically charged. And it's also giving off a whole lot of x-rays. So sometimes clearly the, the material around the supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star, does spin fast enough that it gives off x-rays, but it's not doing it all like the brightness changes over time. So it's a really strange area down there in the middle. So we're talking about here, you know, this, you can see the scale is 240 light years. So it's like 240 light years there. The it's, this is small. We're now on, you know, you could think of a 75 parsecs as we're talking about the sort of distances between the sun and the nearest star. So we're, we're kind of at a smaller scale. So the x-rays here, you can see an x-ray map of the, the center of the Milky Way. We're able to map out the gas and dust using this technique. We can see all kinds of sort of um, material that's interacting with really dense objects, but we can also see the galactic center itself. So um, this is a close-up of Sagittarius A star that is sort of the best image of the center that we have. If we can get um, the ELT, the not ELT, EHT, the uh, Event Horizon Telescope, to you know work the way it worked for uh, the black hole in M87, we might be able to see the actual event horizon and not just this you know very hot gas around the the supermassive black hole itself. This is this is what we're looking at. Is all this gas has been sort of superheated by the gravitational sort of um, field due to Sagittarius A star. Now, finally, it's this really remarkable decades long. Uh, this image goes from 1995 to 2014. I have a video of it that's, uh, I think, a little bit more updated. Um, Andrea Ghez won the Nobel Prize in 2020, 2021, excuse me, uh, or was it 2020? I, I, they all blur together during this pandemic nonsense, but I think it was 2021. Um, this work was uh, maybe a little bit derided 
in the early part of the 21st century and you know over the sort of decades because we're now 21 years in it's gone from this is this is never going to work i guess like maybe it was the late 90s to like by 2010 it was clear that that she was literally mapping out stars orbiting nothing so she had direct evidence that there is something very massive in the center of the galaxy and we can literally see the stars themselves but you don't see what they're going around so here you can see um, this collected data of it all piled together, but you can also, uh, there's a, a video of, of it here in a minute. So um, I don't know why I put this one here. This seems like it should go somewhere else, but you can see that uh, I actually, yes, we touched on this already, the orbits. Um, so I'm not going to do it. We already did that. I don't, it seems like that might be out of order. So um, first of all, let's play this one on the right. So it's a group of let's like maybe 10 or 15 stars. I don't know. Uh, again, Andrea Gez from UCLA and, and her team at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. And you can see that they literally for, I, I don't know if we have the time running here. Oh yeah, you can see that this is even predicting into the future. It's the motion of these stars over time that we have measured it and also kind of playing forward. Like what would they look like in the future? And you can see that especially that one that's going really rapidly, which is called S2, it's going around nothing at all. So that is absolutely astounding that um, this group of astronomers was able to prove that there is something massive there that we can't see. And it's literally, you know, 50 million times the mass of the sun, but giving off no radiation, even though it is heating up the gas around it and making the stars orbit in highly chaotic ways, we can't see it. All right, so we're going to zoom in here from, this is an ESO video. We're going to zoom all the way in on the center of the galaxy. I'm hoping that the audio is coming through. If not, it doesn't matter. I love these zoom in videos. I think they're super cool. Maybe I'll try to full screen this and hope it doesn't crash. Hey, it worked. And if you can't hear the very pleasant sort of spacey music playing, I'm really sorry. It's very calming. So look, you can see how dense the stars are becoming. So the fact that Andrea Gez was able to use Keck with its, uh, this by the way, would be one of those times that adaptive optics that we talked about earlier in the year. What a remarkable achievement. So here, you, that's why they look fuzzy. So you can actually see them going around nothing at all. And then in a minute, they're going to map them out. So we're going to zoom all the way in. This is S2, and you can see we've actually located the exact point where the black hole must be located. This is 2018, and it got as close as 20 billion kilometers, which is, you know, solar system scale. And we're going to zoom out and kind of look at a, I think, I think I saw that this is 45 stars that we're going to map. And this is an ongoing project. So even after Andrea Gez, who started this project when she was young, even after she retires, people are going to continue to measure these stars. It's remarkable that we can see down inside the central region with such clarity with giant telescopes. So um, hang on a minute. Let's get out of that full screen. Cool. We're almost done. Uh, the deal is we don't really know how galaxies formed. We know they merge. We know that as they merge, they change shape and change type. But sort of what, what happened at the beginning is really not clear. So here's one particular model. Um, not necessarily even saying this is the most um, necessarily likely model. But the notion here is that there was giant, absolutely unbelievable giant clouds of hydrogen gas and maybe helium. And that the first thing that would have happened would at the edges, we end up with these globular clusters that formed and the whole cloud starts to rotate. Any cloud that starts to rotate will flatten out and you end up with, um, you know, a spiral structure or a flat disk structure. Uh, it fits what we see, but it doesn't fit everything we see. So um, the Milky Way may be the result of mergers rather than this giant monolithic collapse. And um, that's just an unanswered question. It seems more likely that galaxies grow through merger 
processes. But what about the very first ones? And it's not really clear at all if uh, the first galaxies formed through this monolithic collapse or if they are the result of merging for over the last 14 billion years. So, you know, just another one of the big unanswered questions. So I already mentioned that Andromeda is heading our way. This is M31, Messier 31. It's the nearest spiral galaxy to us. And it's slightly bigger, about the same sort of structure. Um, you can see that it's red in the middle and blue in the outer. So it's heading our way. And um, that's not the only one, though. We're in the middle of, of consuming a galaxy called the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy, which has been pulled into this kind of red. You can see it's been elongated. It probably started out as a like an egg shape or some sort of clump, and it's being stretched out as stars are being pulled inside the Milky Way. Um, this is one of many streams of stars that we have uh, above and below the Milky Way's disk. Uh, here's kind of a cartoony version of what these um, galaxies look like as they get ripped into streams and end up in the halo. Remember, there's a lot of dark matter out in the halo. So uh, there are several of these streams. I want to say there are like five that we've discovered. Um, so this image is based on calculations of somewhat of these, these tidal streams might look like if we swallowed 50 dwarf galaxies over the last 10 billion years. And that's kind of the, the, the standard. We think that that's probably how the Milky Way has grown. Um, not necessarily how it formed, but at least how it's grown. And um, I only mentioned M54. Mainly, I just thought this is a super cool picture. But uh, it is thought that this is the heart of this Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. This would be the central region of a galaxy that we are in the middle of consuming. And this galaxy has been, this piece has been left over. So it's it's perhaps got a supermassive black hole down in its center. It's worth studying, in other words. It's not like the other globular clusters. This is probably the heart of a, a galaxy, and that's why it's so much more dense than uh, others. So just very briefly, uh, this six-slide image, I put it in here because people always ask, how long will it take? So if you skip down to number six, it says, in seven billion years, the Milky Way and Andromeda will finally be merged into one giant elliptical galaxy. So over those six steps, you can see it's going to warp and change. And, and if somehow we were able to leave a camera here because Earth will not be inhabitable by then, the sun, in the next billion years, the sun is going to render Earth uninhabitable. So we need to figure out how to go live somewhere else in the solar system or somewhere else. But this is what it would be like for us over the one through six. That's a, you know, four billion years worth of change. Um, well, I guess seven billion years total until eventually we would. So it should not harm individual stars, individual solar systems. There shouldn't be a lot of smashing together of stars because they're so far apart. However, the gas and dust in the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies will smash together. So there will be a period like in number four where we make like hundreds of millions of new stars. And they're just new, but it'll be the final big burst because at step five and step six, the gas that is left over will be too hot to make any more stars. So it's a depressing kind of uh, end game for Andromeda and Milky Way. The two spirals will smash each other up until the gas and dust becomes too hot to make new stars. But the stars that are already there will, will because they're so far apart from each other, they will not collide. Cool. All right. Well, that is meant to be. Is that everything? Oh, no. I do have a little. Uh, I've already talked about the collision of supermassive black holes. Wait, let me start that over so you can actually hear it. So these are gravitational waves from the collision of two uh, black holes that have been turned into sound. Again, I hope you can hear this. And uh, we've already talked about this several times. So I, I included it here just because. Andromeda and the Milky Way both have supermassive black holes. They will collide, and when they do, they'll give off gravitational waves like this. So, by the way, the top one is from Hanford, which is in um, Washington State, and the bottom one is from um, Livingston, Louisiana. And this is the LIGO experiment literally catching gravitational waves that we have then converted into sound. Um, cool. All right. That's all there is to it. So... Uh, that should wrap up the Milky Way chapter.